her that I'm sorry that I'm leaving I hate to slip away the way I am To wash away the dirt from all my sinning Yeah, when I come back I'll be a better man After serving 40 years in prison, Bernard Smith is being released today. As he has so many times before, Humanity for Prisoners founder Doug Chapkus was there to hold the door to freedom open. Priceless what you've done. Priceless. Much appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you you so much. Thank you, Doug. You're very welcome. Humanity for Prisoners started as a result of helping Maurice Carter a man who was serving a life sentence for a crime he did not commit. Eventually, after serving 29 years, we were able to get him released, not because he was exonerated, but due to a terminal illness. And it was his idea to start Humanity for Prisoners, to help other prisoners with similar problems. When I was hired in 1974, we had five prisons. By the time I left, that system had worked so well that we had probably over 32 prisons. We know that 80% of the crimes that are committed in Michigan are where the person's high on drugs or alcohol when they occur. And once they get to prison, they certainly are sober and repentant, but they still need help in getting control. What we did basically in our country is we closed our institutionalized mental health systems of asylums because of horrible things that were happening, but we didn't create anything else to help. And so what we've done is we've basically shifted a significant portion of the mental health population from institutionalized in asylums, institutionalized in prisons, which is not really a better move. Now people with mental health issues are being placed alongside actual hardened criminals that do need to be in prison. And that's not healthy for either of those people. The work of Humanity for Prisoners, without a doubt, is a ministry coming straight from Jesus' mouth. He says, I was in prison, you came and visited me. The work that we do is servant work. The focus of Humanity for Prisoners started by assisting those who were wrongly convicted, but soon shifted to helping prisoners who were serving sentences for crimes they had committed. Most prisoners are eventually released. While incarcerated, they need help. They need help with medical care, contacting their families, facing the parole board, countless similar problems. And addressing these problems are what we call action with compassion and serves a role in helping inmates successfully transition from prison life into society. I met Doug in 2001. He came to visit me for the first time. We spent probably about an hour together. Five years ago, our life changed a great deal when our daughter was sentenced to 25 years in prison. I am a mother of three. My children are older. The devastation that I put on my family and children was more than I can even think about. As the wife of an inmate, I'm living a single life. There's no one at home. It's challenging to say the least. There's always going to be a segment of the population who says, They got what they deserved, they don't deserve squat from me. They did an evil thing, they did a nasty thing, and therefore they don't deserve uh, compassion. They don't deserve uh, any sort of uh, humanity. That attitude is going to always poison the attempts of groups like Humanity for Prisoners from really being able to move forward and saying, you know, we really have this mission. I don't think people understand the expense that goes along with having a family member in prison. To visit our daughter is a, a four, about a four hour trip. That's one way. When I was first incarcerated, I had a counselor that I talked to as I went in and I would never forget her saying to me, so what are you gonna do when your husband divorces you? And I was appalled and just shocked. Like how in the world could you say that to me? I've been happily married for you know 15 years with three children. And lo and behold, a couple of years before I got out, my husband divorced me. Another difficult thing for us is that um, we probably won't be alive by the time she gets out of prison. There are many people in prison who are going to die in prison. My work in end-of-life care has really caused me an opportunity to to take a look at uh, at that that population. How are they being cared for? Are they receiving the uh, you know the, the the medication, the care, the support, the resources necessary to bring about a meaningful end-of-life 
circumstance. It's really important that all of us care about how prisoners are treated. I think you can make a moral or philosophical argument that these are human beings and they deserve to be treated like human beings. But you can also make the argument that what if it's you someday? What if you get involved in something that finds you behind bars, whether rightly or wrongly? And a lot of people don't realize that you never know when something like this could happen to your family. It's not something we ever thought would ever happen to us. Our prison system is set up to institutionalize people, to make them faceless, to make them nameless. These walls are funny. First you hate them, then you get used to them. Enough time passes, you get so you depend on them. That's institutionalization. It's been my experience as, as a clinical social worker that when prisoners or detainees are not institutionalized, they tend to be able to acclimate better and more successfully into the community. The first thing, of course, you see when you get out is you're going to use a real fork, knife, and spoon. And this is huge because you've used a spork for the whole time you're incarcerated, you're not allowed to have any of that stuff. And you sit and think about, oh man, I would love to have some green grapes, or I would love to have a cucumber, or I would, things that you take so for granted, you smell, you know, like a flower or a candle, or to, you know, touch a baby or to pet a dog. Just to talk a little bit more about being institutionalized, the years of sensory deprivation, the years of regiment and routine, of limited choices, of limited interactions, you know, um, and I fought against it, you know, and I thought I was doing well, I, you know, I, and I wasn't, you know, I, I, I wasn't, I think I was doing worse than most when I look back on it. When I was in prison, I was in one of the prison programs, um, a self-help program, and there were some repeat offenders in there, and some guys who'd done some long time, some short time, had been in and out four, five, six, seven times, and they would tell us, young kids that, and I didn't believe them. They would say that they would come back at, at, by Brooks and park across the street from the prison so that they could see their friends, watch them play basketball. And, and when, when you hear it, and when I heard it in prison, being in prison, I thought, they're out of their mind. These guys are losers. I'm better than that. You know, that's crazy. It's completely sane. Becoming institutionalized, I don't really feel that I did and I was determined not to. And I was fortunate enough that I had enough outside visits and phone calls and mail that I did not. I watched it with a lot of people and it's definitely very easy to do because they have no, they have no reason not to become institutionalized. They have no reason not to want to join in with where they're going to be for a very long amount of time. If we've put them in a situation where their own personal survival is a daily or an hourly uh, battle. What happens when we put them back on the street? How are they supposed to say, oh, okay, everything's fine now? No. They're going to be in that same mindset. There's no doubt why so many prisoners end up back there and, and why they have such a hard time adjusting. If we restore to people the dignity of their humanity, that perhaps when they do exit the prison system, they will make different choices. I was one of the very lucky ones that had mail, I had mail calls, I would get a lot of mail and stuff from church and friends and family, and, but most of the people do not. There's only 12% of the uh, prisoners that get visits, and that provides a lot of social uh, um, isolation, and they don't always really keep their social skills up, which makes it harder to reintegrate into society. I found that the prisons that had the most outside community involvement were the safest. Uh, the prisoners, if they're left just to be locked up, they uh, will oftentimes uh, turn to each other for guidance. And without any outside intervention, that doesn't turn out to be a very good way to live. The family members need to be encouraged to support the prisoners. Um, the, to visit them and also to maintain contact with them and assist them. One of the amazing things that Humanity for Prisoners does is that it chooses to operate on the individual level. 
There are thousands of individuals in our prisons that have individual problems that no group work can really help with. We are the one and only organization in the state of Michigan that engages with prisoners on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Someone was asking through me um, to ask Humanity for Prisoners to find a brother that they lost contact with, and they did that. They've done a crime. They can never undo that crime, no matter how much they've changed. So they need to have to go on with their lives too. You know, Doug just emailed me the other day. He's got a guy here in Emmett County that is on some sort of a time deadline to get out of town and uh, has no place to go, has nothing, no skills, no training, no nothing, coming out of prison, no possessions. And Doug says, somebody has to help him. <laughs> and I don't know what I'm going to do yet. I just got this email. I'm going to do something. But how is, it that we, how is it that we call that successful criminal justice if the end result is a person that is very likely to have to commit another crime in order to survive? Outside advocacy groups such as Humanity for Prisoners play an important role because they have to be a voice essentially for the prisoners. Oftentimes prisoners won't describe what it is they really what, what they're concerned about and what they need, but they will explain it better to an outside group, and then they can get assistance. He was really helpful when it got near my parole date, preparing for parole. Um, kind of prepped me and, and got me ready for that interview. I did receive a parole. Prisoners that I see will probably within the next year or two be released. I think they're going to be met with much uh, discrimination when they get out. Not in my backyard will be what many people will say. What I would like to say to those who live near these people is to give them a chance. Let them prove themselves. Churches, when they engage with prisoners, engage in this sort of prison ministry evangelism approach, uh, which often doesn't realize that actually the vast majority of prisoners that are in American prisons are already Christians. Uh, they don't need to be evangelized, they just need to be welcomed back into the fold. And also the fact that over and over again, when prisoners and offenders would exit the prison system and would go to churches, the very churches whose members had gone into the prisons to be with them and would say, I'm out, I want to come, I want to be a part of your church, churches would turn them away saying prison ministry is something we do there. We don't necessarily want to have offenders in our building. And that struck me as a profound injustice. A lot of them that come back to us want to give back. They want to do, they want to make a change in their lives. They want to do something that impacts the community for the good. Jennifer Thompson Canino and Ronald Cotton are authors of the New York Times bestseller, Picking Cotton about the wrongful conviction of Ronald Cotton, who served over 10 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. Organizations such as Humanity for Prisoners that go into the prisons and work one-on-one -on -one with inmates help to decrease institutionalization and therefore increase the success rate of the inmates when they come out. And that makes all of us safe and that builds a better and brighter community. The morning that I got out, I had my mom and my dad and my kids, and um, lo and behold, there stood Doug. He drove all the way from Grand Haven to Ypsilanti to hold the door open for me. And man, he made me feel like I was the most important person in the world that day. Joe Evans was released from prison on July 13th, 2015. Humanity for Prisoners founder, Doug Japkus, was there. This was Joe's first interview moments after his release. There's so many people in prison that has no one. They had nobody to turn to. They're just in prison, lost. And uh, they reach out to you, Doug. I'm not the person that I once was, that I'm a man who paid uh, a dear price for the crimes that I committed. And uh, that's not who I am anymore. It was exciting for me to be able to hold that door open for you, man. How did that feel when you walked out? Uh, oh, there was a plethora of emotions. I felt uh, elated. I felt uh, just happy. I felt blessed. Um, How many years, Joe? 39 years, four months, two weeks, and one day. Wow. Tell her that I'm sorry that I'm leaving. I hate to slip away the way I am. 
To wash away the dirt from all my sin in. Yeah, when I come back I'll be a better man Oh, when I come back I'll be a better man Yeah Tell her there was no plan that I've been scheming I only let it roll the way I feel Let her know that she has not been dreaming No, and everything I'm telling her is real Yes, when I come back I'll be a better man Oh, when I come back I'll be a better man